Hello. Thank you all so much uh, for coming. We have lots of cartoons, lots of slides. In fact, uh, and we've got to be out here at 11.30, so it turns out uh, you're going to have to hold all your laughter to the end. <laughs> o already you're not listening. I can just see the type of audience you are. We got the sound and everything. You know, what? Uh, laughter in the New Yorker cartoons, uh, I'm going to be a little devil's advocate here about laughter because everybody thinks laughter is so great, and I sort of enjoy it. but. Uh, a little jaded by now, and, and, and when I started the presentation, uh, I said, you know, I really want to give these people 100%, and then I realized, you know, the times we live in, I'm thinking maybe 75% is enough. <laughs> you know, 50%, uh, and, 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 and if I said 11.5% annualized, guaranteed, <laughs> yeah, you'd work. But really, 100% uh, uh, you know, laughter, everyone's talking about this is what 100% laughter looks like. We got the sound, right? You don't have the sound. You got it? <laughs> That's my first wife. Uh, uh. And really, the last person who was that satisfied in the state I live in was uh, this guy. <laughs> so laughter, you know, I think you're seeing what laughter, what's sort of the black sun at the heart of laughter is ridicule, isn't it? It's a little bit nasty, isn't it? It's not all good things, is it, and stuff. And when we look back on the history about how people looked at laughter, uh, Plato said, you know, it's a mixture of pleasure and pain, malice of amusement, you certainly saw that. Aristotle thought, you know what, it's that, it's that, and we laugh at something deformed as long as we don't have empathy with it. And Hobbes, the superiority theorist, he was the functional guy, said, why do we have it? Because we feel good when others are put down, and he puts them down. <laughs> and, oh yeah, it's the, <laughs> it's the other guy, it's the other guy. Uh, Lord Chesterfield had wonderful things to say to his son, all sorts of good advice, but here's the real advice that he gave him. He said, frequent and loud laughter is characteristic of folly and ill manners and how unbecoming a thing laughter is, not to mention the disagreeable noise it makes and the shocking distortion of the face. I have never laughed in my life. He was very proud of this. He had a point. Ed Corrin did a wonderful cartoon sort of expressing this a number of years ago. I'm sorry, but I don't laugh out loud. <laughs> as late as 1875, you have this guy, George Vassy, saying, look at the distortions of the human face that laughter occurs. It just makes it look horrible. The self-conceited smile, the insidious smile, the superlative laugh, the sardonic sneer. And I've seen all of that <laughs> today. He thought all of it was basically this, pranks. And 90% of the stuff on the internet... Careful, Billy. That monkey used to be in the collection business. <laughs> Absolutely proving the point. That's what you're laughing. I thought you were here for sophisticated New Yorker humor. I don't think so. Okay, but at the New Yorker, we guard against this. We have, a, we have people there, as the cartoons that come in, and we also have people in the back. We have William Shawn, we have Harold Ross. And should a cartoon, a vulgar cartoon, appear like this? <laughs> Oop, uh, William Sh <laughs> sorry about that. William Shawn stops it. Now, I'll show you how it works also. Feeling. When I became cartoon editor, David Mamet sent me this very nice note saying he'd taken the liberty of sending me a bunch of cartoons. And this is what I sent back to him. <laughs> exactly my point, exactly my point. Now, I don't mind rejecting things, really, because I am... Uh, an abused cartoonist myself. I submitted 2,000 cartoons to the New Yorker magazine before anyone would ever accept it, okay? And there I am in 1976 trying to get published. 
And then I got this over and over again. Now finally it changed to this. But fortunately, my humor evolved from this type of vulgarity. <laughs> but still, my point I want to make here, at the heart of humor, at the base of it, it connects us with, 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 with ridicule and with deflation. And we can't get away with that. We try to get away with it, and we move into intellectual areas. Art is the elevation of things. We move towards it. It's beautiful. Humor deflates. <laughs> and it does it quickly. People ask how you, how you get cartoons. You think of them. <laughs> but once again, it, there must be a diminishment, in my opinion. There must be a lowering of, of, of the conceptual frame. The serious vision of life, ah, oh, that's it, the last for your The comic vision. <laughs> the comic vision, different than the track, it, it enjoys complexity. There is no justice in the world, there is some justice in the world, the world is just. <laughs> It likes ambivalence and ambiguity, you know, rather than just black and white. On the one hand, eliminating the middleman would result in lower cost, increased sales, and greater consumer satisfaction. On the other hand, we're the middleman. <laughs> and then, of course, <laughs> this joke, which you just heard, so not as funny, but uh, uh, my philosophy of how you make jokes is it's opposition of scripts, for me uh, uh, anyway. Why I wrote that line, no Thursdays out, how about never is never good for you? Why put is never good for you? Because the two things opposing each other is the message is rude and the syntax is polite. <laughs> the comic vision, my vision, and I think you're going to see the vision of the cartoonist here, tempers idealism with pragmatism. And the point of the New Yorker cartoons, my cartoons, all the cartoons. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this over to, 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 to three people who really, I think, embody you know, this type of tradition. They understand where humor comes from, but they do it with a special grace and a, a special thoughtfulness. And now, Ed, you are ready. Ed Corr. I'm going to start with two different approaches to this craft, this odd craft that we both, we all share. This is a strange uh, kind of compendium of writing and drawing, um, one dependent on the other. Um, I will, the first is, is a quote from Dorothy Parker who wrote an introduction to The Seal in the Bedroom, and it more or less characterizes ex what we all do in this strange activity we, we end up doing every day. Um, and she writes about James Thurber in, in the uh, introduction to A Seal in the Bedroom. She said, Thurber deals solely in culminations. Beneath his pictures, and I, his pictures meaning all our pictures, beneath his pictures, he sets only the final line. He gives you a glimpse of the startling present and lets you go construct the astonishing past. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful way of approaching and uh, savoring cartoons. And the other, and more in line with what Bob has been talking about, is a, is a, a quote from Lily Tomlin who s said, no matter how cynical I get, I can never keep up. <laughs> so, with that, um, Bob has included the, the, my first cartoon, and I think with the, all of us, all three of us as well, the first cartoons. I did this in 1962, and I'm um, now among the more senior members of this strange kind of confraternity that we, we make up. Um, this was 
this would never fly now, uh, only because it makes no sense. Uh, <laughs> cult culturally, it was of the moment when t-shirts and sweatshirts were becoming far more animated on their surface than they ever were before, and aside from the old school uh, ties which you wanted to, to uh, broadcast, like Harvard, say. Um, this, this was relatively unknown, and so this, this was in 1962, in April 62, when my, and it was my first cartoon after, you say, 2,000 submissions. I think I had 10,000, so. <laughs> Um, and finally, I got the acceptance, which is pretty much what <laughs> Bob, Bob has very well characterized. So, um, and it was also terribly drawn, in my view. I, did, I just couldn't draw very well, and I was trying to draw as New Yorker, uh, what I thought New Yorker cartoon should be like. And happily, over 47 years, I got disabused of that. So this being the next, Fast forward to the <laughs> mid-2000s, and says, I, can everybody read that? I'm not sure. Okay, um, I'm having my annual reunion with Polar Tech, Thinsulate, Fleece, and my oldest friend, Wool. <laughs> and I gather a few in Chicago appreciate something like that. <laughs> That's peak and off peak. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, the language never disappoints. It says, how's my drinking? <laughs> and I, I kind of perversely put my own telephone number on, on the back. <laughs> this will buy you four months. <laughs> This, this, it's kind of a bittersweet. I mean, the thing about cartoons is, is, is that it's a form of generosity, kind of angry generosity that someone once characterized Dickens as being. It says security there. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have watched very hapless looking people patrolling the perimeter of some, some place or other with this giant word on the back of their jacket and they look as if they could provide nothing whatsoever like this. <laughs> yes, I'm still getting up early, but these days it's to check on the spot markets for oil and natural gas. <laughs> Mom, listen to how much atmospheric pollution we produce just going to my soccer games. <laughs> a lot of what, this is all quasi-autobiographical to be sure, and I think almost everything you will see today has, has an autobiographical tinge to it, no, no matter how outrageous. <laughs> Disgust on car talk. <laughs> <laughs> I model this after the old East German car, the Trabant, the Trabi, as it's called, which is very much like this. We breed them for aggression. <laughs> and where did you put the rest of the moose? I live in a place where hunting is a culture, and I'm always amazed by the reactions to, uh, to such a thing. Tell them how hard we've worked to protect their habitat. <laughs> the hard part was how to, having to draw those two in the tree and having them cling to it. These are, these are the practical problems that uh, putting ideas like this into, um, onto a final form. Oh. Proud parents of underachievers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
People have asked me where, where, your, where these ideas, I mean, they ask all of us where these ideas come from. And that actually happened, with minus the bumper sticker, or the sticker. It was, uh, I, I saw this van like that with two kids like that. And it just presented itself. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Artisanal pottery. And down at the bottom, artisan. We're walking for the common cold. <laughs> Our psychopharmacologist is a genius. I mean, they, 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 for me, the interesting challenge was how to get them up in the air and how to, how to draw that ground plane so that they would be suspended and, uh, and, and, and joyous. I mean, these are practical problems that we all face. Dad, will the heroin, 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 heroin go into rehab? <laughs> You, you will note all those pictures of horses and the little uh, ribbons of achievement on the, on the wall. What's it like to be the parent of a non-human? <coughs> One of my enduring interests is people and their pets. And their, a, this is not a conversation you need to join. <laughs> I got ready. <laughs> Can I get back to you? Right now I'm postcoital. <laughs> we think it's terribly important that you meet the people responsible for the food you're eating tonight. It's probably hard to read, but every possible per food provider is there. She's exceptionally fluent in body as a second language. I'm global and I'm warm. And in addition, you get a generous signing bonus. Said, what's that? Is that me? Oh, sorry. Um, hi, honey. What achievements today? <laughs> you know, I never properly vetted you. <laughs> this, was, this was published right after the Sarah Palin uh, <laughs> candidacy, so it, had, it has a secondary, or actually, then a primary interest. <laughs> What do you have in size extra small? Please be patient. We are drilling for fuel. <laughs> I'm, and earlier, of course, it was during the campaign where the drilling issue was so prominent. Give me a whiskey with a shot of wheatgrass, ginger beet, and local honey. Actually, where I live, this is a real delicacy. <laughs> you can see by its smile that this halibut was humanely killed. The message here is hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Human Resources wants to know if you still wish to identify with the gender on your birth certificate. <laughs> and now I give you Pat Burns. Yeah.
made it just before the applause stopped. Um, I see it. It's right here. Bob wanted us to start with our first cartoons we uh, started with in The New Yorker, and this was mine. It's a couple of models. I'm so hungry I could eat half a sandwich. <laughs> See, I got nudity into my first cartoon in The New Yorker, and that's uh, it was all downhill from there. Uh, Bob put out his ridicule. Uh, theory of humor, which uh, I was backstage, just being a, a, an innate contrarian, I was trying to debate him on, but realized with the cartoons I brought today, uh, I, I, I stood like no chance of, of winning that debate. This cartoon, we, I'm going to start with this just to kind of illustrate my fundamental approach to at least any cartoon with a message. A lot of the stuff is just silly, and, and there's a place for that, but here we've got this, uh, this muck and muck guy figure, you know, like some... Say, say somebody at Goldman Sachs contemplating securitizing mortgages or you know, before he gets his, you know, flu shot. <laughs> hmm, what would Satan do? <laughs> this was uh, the title to my first uh, book of cartoons, and it kind of sums up my, my, the dominant theme in a lot of my work. It, the, the, the technique of ridicule here is to embrace the opposite position and strip it of its guile. It, all right, it's thankfully more complex than that, otherwise anyone could do it and I'd be out of work. But that's the, the basic idea. Well, here's, now, you know that I'm married to somebody of a political nature and uh, my work is not political. People often ask me when they meet me, um, you know, they, first they hear that I'm a you know, cartoonist which follows the question, so are you a lawyer too? And I, I say, no, I'm a cartoonist. And the next thing they ask is, seriously? To which, <laughs> to which I say, uh, no, the, the funny kind. And <laughs> an awkward silence follows that. But usually they have better social skills than I do, so they think of something else to say. And they say, oh, so do you do uh, political work? And I, I say, no, because otherwise she wouldn't have married me. And, I'd still be this pasty, lonely troll slaving away in my <laughs> cave. But that doesn't mean that I can't get cartoons and ideas from the events of her day. Here we have a, you know, a couple of you know, lawyers on a courtroom steps. and Remember, we can only afford to do all this pro bono because of how much the anti-bono pays. <laughs> This comes from an actual story about uh, some muckety-muck law firm that was uh, offering to do some pro bono work for the state, which is a great thing, except their idea of pro bono was 200 bucks an hour. I mean, for that, Mother Teresa could have self-financed. Anyway, we got more fat cats, a panhandler, and our line is, I much prefer random acts of kindness to the habitual ones. Okay. <laughs> so it's not that I don't understand what you know, the pop psychologists call compassion fatigue. In fact, I should probably go track down that, that homeless guy and you know, give him a, his fair share of the, what I got for the cartoon, but nah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, this strange adventure that my life has become since getting uh, involved with somebody who has like a real life um, occasionally, I have to put on suits and, and look respectable, and even more respectable than this, and uh, go to events. And, and on one such occasion, we were at this event where, at the table of maybe a dozen people, the only two other than us who were not billionaires, yes, b -b 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 billionaires, were the Hollywood mega movie star couple sitting across from us. So, yes, naturally, needless to say, this event was for the environment. And <laughs> the host uh, trumpeted the fact that the, the night's festivities were carbon neutral. And I thought, you know, I, you know, the engineer in me says, wait a minute. I started crunching the numbers on the, 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 the terawatt lighting, the, the projection on mist. They had a screen with mist. And, 
and you know the, the limos and the because these billionaires weren't slumming it and <laughs> I swear there are third world countries out there whose leading export are carbon credits <laughs> so you may have gathered that that maybe I have some issues with with privilege and attribute it to my you know, lower middle class youth in Detroit. But you gotta admit that, that privilege does have its loathsome excesses. I mean, if you drove here this morning, you probably saw this guy on the road and you probably hoped to see this scenario. Well, here's the scenario he wished for. Ooh, I'm sorry, sir, that sign was meant for someone with a less expensive car. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I'm too judgmental. <laughs> or maybe I just, you know, think about stuff too much. Like, right, here's another trend that confuses me. Uh, you got tattoo shop guy in the chair getting a head tattoo like you see way too often. Anything that suggests corporate banking. <laughs> you want to get rich? Invent a painless tattoo removal technique because I swear to you, 50 years from now, all you're going to hear around the retirement home swimming pool is, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> all right, here's a trend that would be less problematic except for the pernicious persistence of photographs on uh, the internet. I had it cut so I can style it professionally at work and still look stupid at night. I figured this crowd wouldn't be young enough that I'd offend anybody. <laughs> All right, let's go once more to the theme of social devolution. Um, you know the scene. Come on, we're all gonna sit around the campfire and play our iPods. <laughs> now, for some reason, and this is true, this cartoon shows, a lot, shows up a lot on bulletin boards in public restrooms. I, that wasn't a joke, that was serious. I mean, it, it, I've had reports from as far as Glacier National Park. Um, anyway, a, a week and a half ago, those of you that read the Tribune might have seen a piece about digital piracy where another guy and I had a smackdown debate about you know, copyright protections, you know, the sort of thing that people up here use to feed their children. <laughs> and I was the strident law and order killjoy who advocated the radical position of, oh, obeying the law, <laughs> but just, you, just in case you thought this might have been a recent bug up my backside, uh, here's an old cartoon, a uh, kid you know, trying to cheat on a chess, uh, test. For emphasis, I made it a music class. Mr. Jackson, you know how I feel about sampling? <laughs> there was a discussion about where cartoonists get their ideas, and I've often described myself as a, you know, Procto-entomologist. <laughs> that is, when I get a bug up my butt, I, I, I want to study it, because there's probably a meal in that. From selling the cartoon, not from... Like, for instance, remember when comprehensive manuals came with computer software and equipment, and whatever you didn't understand was just a free phone call away? I know it's tech support, but for two fifty a minute, I expect you to talk dirty. <laughs> this came from a reporter friend's grievances. Actually, I work for a newspaper, but people won't talk to me without it. <laughs> When we retire, I want to watch travel videos. <laughs> These here kind of sort of explain themselves. Mind if I have the guys over to watch some poker? <laughs> Seriously, on TV these days, you, you can watch sweaty, unshaven blobs playing cards <laughs> on cable, which is like TV, except you have to pay for it. Uh, oh, here's just the caption that says, um, Will you turn that TV down? Can't you see I'm on the phone? Not that funny? Nope. 
Um, okay, we're making the, the last big segue here on, on themes, and uh, no, it's not just me lamenting the folly of my native Detroit. How much is that in years of tuition? <laughs> See, my grandfather left the fields of Canada to come to this land of opportunity. Yes, he came over on the bridge. <laughs> and he came to work in the auto assembly plant, and I still have at home, and I treasure his 20-year pin from the Hudson auto assembly plant. That's, yeah, that's the same Hudson as the fabulous Hudson Hornet, which if you have kids, you may have seen the Pixar movie Cars a hundred times. <laughs> that's the segue I'm talking about. Uh, kids, you see, back when my wife was uh, still my fiance, we were sitting down in front of the TV cameras for a puff piece softball interview, a getting to know you piece. And the reporter asked me a question that he had asked you know, a million times of every male candidate he'd ever interviewed. And so it was only fair that he should ask the, the female candidate. And he said, so if you have children and you are attorney general, who's going to take care of them? <laughs> the enlightened male. Now, I was even more enlightened because I did not leap across the room and punch his lights out in front of the cameras no matter how many more votes that would have gotten my wife. Um, I said in a voice I'd like to remember as calm and even, I work from home, I make my own hours, and in one fell swoop, I became a future stay-at-home dad. <laughs> so but here's a tip. If, if you're going to have that discussion with your betrothed, yeah, try to do it before the camera's on. <laughs> anyway, so... Uh, it, if you don't know, parenting these days is actually a verb. It's also a blood sport. <laughs> We're going to the park to size up the competition. <laughs> Here's upbeat kid. We beat the spread! <laughs> Here is a tot tip from Captain Dad. Kids don't make this stuff up. They get it from somewhere. <laughs> oh, here's a calendar cartoon. Uh, it's the November cartoon on next year's New Yorker calendar for those of you subscribers who've got your free calendar. But you can't miss her second grade first semester graduation. <laughs> See, I don't get it. When I was a kid, I mean, in our house, graduation meant one thing. And it didn't mean that, that highly qualified high school graduation. No, no, it meant the real thing. I mean, when graduating high school, I think my parents gave me a card. Actually, yep, sure my dad's there. You can ask him if you don't believe me. All right, kids being dropped off at Mount Fundament Boarding School. I swore I wouldn't make the same mistakes with my children as my parents did. A guy can dream. Um, so I had this plan when I you know, was having kids. We were not going to spoil our kids with too much stuff. But, you know, I was a first-time parent to it, clueless, and I had reckoned without grandparents, <laughs> particularly grandmas, and grandmas with first-time grandchildren who are girls. <laughs> I mean, uh, grandchildren like a, a fantasy camp for women. It's, it's like... <laughs> choose. All the fun and, and none of the sleep deprivation. <laughs> so you, you cannot blame them for going nuts, but that didn't stop me from grumbling under my breath. Then one day I took a look around the, the playroom, which used to be a, a living room when we bought the house, but, you know. <laughs> and I swear to you, this room, no exaggeration, is bigger than my first apartment. And I'm looking at our playroom with the colorful padded mat that I laid down over the floor and, and this, this little plastic playhouse, not little, I mean, it could, it could house a third world family, playhouse in the corner and, and the, the, the pretend kitchen we bought because it was blue and, and the, the, the everything and, well, mother, please, I can spoil my own child. This brings us back to Bob's point about ridicule. Sometimes it, we ridicule ourselves, and I, I often do that because I, at the time of the first child, I was doing a book on parenting cartoons, 
And I, I, before I even had kids, I did most of these. And the point was for when I became a parent to look at the cartoons and go, mm, don't do that. <laughs> and so it's that kind of a ridicule that um, sums up my, you know, what was Satan to approach. Um, but we got to remember that forgiving ourselves and others is the kind of compassion that, that is redemptive in humor, like with this man t instructing his son. Just remember, son, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose unless you want daddy's love. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, I give you Roz Chest. Hi. Um, I, I like to start, this was not my first cartoon in the... All right, all right, it'll be there. Um, I, I sometimes like to start with this slide because I think in a lot of ways this sort of uh, sort of sent me on this somewhat strange path of being a cartoonist. My parents were uh, terrible hypochondriacs. I'm not sure whether I would have uh, stumbled on this myself, but I mean, you, you know from the time you're really little, like, it's really interesting that you sort of have this body. And very shortly after that, you realize all the terrible things that can go wrong with it. And yet you have really no choice because you can't sort of like leave it behind and go about your business. It's sort of like always there with you. And um, I kind of realized that very early on in my life. And uh, here, here's a picture of me, um, age nine. I'm lying in bed. I'm reading the big book of horrible rare diseases. Um, <laughs> Lockjaw Monthly. I was obsessed with Lockjaw. I don't know why. Um, um, lo uh, everything you always wanted to know about scurvy, but were afraid to ask. Um, diseases of the tropics. A child's gardens, garden of maladies. And um, the worst of all was a book called The Merck Manual, which um, my, my mother's sister was a registered nurse and had given my mother a copy of this book, which we had around the house. It was kind of our Bible. And it was just kind of like out there, and it always had like articles from the newspaper on other like diseases that related to the diseases in the book, and you know, and or notes that my mother was like writing about diseases she had seen on television and stuff like that. So you know, I learned about like people who suddenly turned blue, or people who turned orange, or people who turned silver. That is actually a thing called argyria. I mean, you can like turn silver. And, uh, and it comes from, there's something in, like, all right, maybe this isn't, has nothing to do, but it, it, it's, it's in, an, like, if you use too much of a certain nasal spray, you can get, you can, like, turn silver, you can get Argyria. So, um, anyway, I worried a lot about things. I worried a lot about um, medical things when I was a kid. And um, this, was, this was my first cartoon in The New Yorker. Um, and I had a very different experience from Bob and Ed. I mean, I really did never, I never thought I was going to do, wind up doing cartoons for The New Yorker. I thought if I, I wanted to be a cartoonist, I sort of, from the time I was very little, I drew, I loved to draw, and my drawings, whether or not I wanted them to come out funny, they sort of came out funny. I mean, I still remember being around eight or nine years old, and this was a, a time where a lot of little girls were into drawing horses. And I, I knew this from the kids in my class, and I also knew this because we subscribed to Highlights Magazine. And there was our own page, and they had drawings. And I was, uh, looked at those drawings obsessively and also like, would see you know, how old the kid was who drew them and like, whether I was better or worse than them. And it was like, you know, I hated if I saw, like, if I was like nine, and then I would see a drawing, you know, Susie Smith, age seven, and it was inevitably a horse. It was like this horse's head with the mane and the veins and the prancing and the, everything. And um, so one day I decided, even though I hated horses, I really did not like them. They were much too big. They had teeth, just way, went way too back. I, didn't, I also didn't like the big eye on the side. I didn't like them at all. And, and you, if you were on top of a horse, you were very, very high up. I really, and I lived in Brooklyn, so I didn't really see a lot of horses um, in, in person. And, uh, and I, I didn't even really like dogs, you know? 
And uh, anyway, because um, I, I grew up in an apartment. And, and uh, so one day I decided, I was a girl, and I, I was, really wanted to get my drawing into highlights. And I thought, I really, I need to draw horses. And I practiced drawing horses. I just, over and over, I filled up this whole book of like these horses, and I named them. They were like blacky and whitey and prancy and, you know, just everything. And, and when I was all done, I spent like hours and hours on this. I looked at them and I started laughing and laughing. They were like the worst horses in the world. They were just, they were smiling, they, 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 and I couldn't figure out that back leg with the bend, and, and, and I think at that time, there was something in my head that I thought, okay, these horses just suck. These are terrible horses. These are the worst horses anybody ever drew, but they're very, they're funny, and I don't really know why, but this is how I like to draw. So um, anyway, this is, uh, by this point, I had sort of gone back to cartooning, uh, with this cartoon, and there weren't, when I started in 1978, there weren't a lot of magazines taking cartoons. There was uh, The New Yorker, there was National Lampoon, which I had sold a few cartoons to, The Village Voice, I had sold cartoons to them, and Playboy, and I even tried Playboy, but it was really, my cartoons were like parodies of Playboy cartoons. And um, I just could not, you know, it was like, gal running around the desk and then the guy chasing the gal running around the, I don't know, it was just ridiculous. Um, and, uh, and this was, I, I, so I got together all of my cartoons. I had probably like 60 cartoons and I made up a pile. And, um, and this was probably the strangest one of all of them. And I dropped them off at the New Yorker. And this was just like, people asked me, what is this about? And I thought, they're just like, you know, when you're drawing, and you make up little like funny syllables and you're kind of like, <laughs> Kel, <laughs> you know. I mean, may maybe you don't do this, but I, <laughs> I do this, you know. I mean, I'm doodling and I'm like, sued. <laughs> and, but I just never thought like anybody else would find this funny, but I just put it in there. And this is the one, they, the first time I dropped off a, bunch of cartoons. I went to pick them up and I never expected to sell anything and uh, there was a note from Lee Lorenz uh, telling me to come back and see him and he told me that um, I sold this cartoon so I was, I was pretty stunned and uh, but then I just kept going back so now I'm like a million years later I'm still doing the same well different cartoons hopefully but, um, but I'm still going into the New Yorker every week for the art meetings although I don't go in person anymore. Facts. So. All right. Um, this is um, another sort of hypochondria cartoon which never ran in the New Yorker, but um, it's sort of, uh, this is, she bent down to pick up the pencil. This is what children overhear. She bent down to pick up the pencil and when she stood up, she was blind in her left eye. <laughs> my, my relatives were also into this kind of conversation. So they would come over and they would tell these stories. When he woke up, his feet had swollen to the size of watermelons. I mean, I still remember my uncle t talking about somebody he knew who when they woke up, they were bleeding from every pore. <laughs> Her scalp became infected, so they had to remove it. <laughs> his fingernails fell off one by one. Um, they drilled a hole in his larynx and put in a pipe that stretched clear across the room. And Mrs. Cleary's son was born with two stomachs, but he didn't find out till he was 36. Um, uh, this is a uh, Pigeon Little. And uh, The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sky. Is, oh, look, part of a bagel. Um, this actually came from life. This is when moms dance, and uh, the the mom comes into the room and she's just doing. Like, I don't know if you have like teenage kids, but like sometimes if you want to get their attention, like negative, positive, it doesn't matter. If you just want to get their attention, like just do a little dance in front of them. Nothing like really intense. But, uh, but my daughter had some music on the boombox and she, she actually said to me, 
stop, you're hurting me. <laughs> and, and I asked her if I could use it as a line in a cartoon, and she was kind enough to say okay. So. Um, this is a... Um, <laughs> downward spiral of everything. Um, this cartoon is the gifts from the house of low goals. And uh, we have t-shirts, uh, I survived conjunctivitis, I can read a, bu I can read a bus schedule, 100% human DNA, and the special occasion cakes. And uh, wow, only six cavities. Um, happy tattoo removal. And no loitering arrests in one year. Um, the cards are, I'm so glad you're not an arsonist, and congratulations on your new easy chair. And the trophies are uh, just, is, is just participant. <laughs> um, but I actually, I got the idea for this cartoon from an ad for Caravel Cakes that I saw, and it was this, this, I guess it was on a commuter train coming home, and um, I'd never seen a cake like this. It was a girl sitting in front of the cake, and her parents had just brought her this, and it said, and she was blowing out the candles, and it said, congratulations on your new glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, no wonder people are enormous. I mean, you just like <laughs> get a giant cake. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on waking up. <laughs> um, <laughs> this has nothing to do <laughs> with the. <laughs> it's, a sh it's a short name, so. <laughs> um, uh, this is a. <laughs> Afghanagap. Can, can you read it back there? Oh, okay. They have classic cargo, pleated front, flat front, slim fit with lycra, relaxed fit, and cropped. Um... This is a... Um, yeah. um, this is a... On display at the Children's House of Horrors. You have the Hall of Snowsuits, um, the plate where different foods are touching one another. <laughs> Um, the, the gallery of inexplicable fears um, and the live demonstration of the shampoo at <laughs> one, three, and five. Um, this is a... The, <laughs> kind of a tunnel of love sort of joke, I guess. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is, um, sometimes I just like the way certain language sounds, so this is um, The Burlitz Guide to Floweries. Congratulations on your stomach stapling. Um, I like you, I'm just not attracted to you. Um, have a great time in Nebraska or whatever. Um, I apologize for saying your parents are, were degenerates. And happy birthday, it must feel weird to be 60. <laughs> Um, this is uh, alternative illnesses for alternative medicine. We have feldspar deficiency, uh, pseudocarma, past life bursitis, and leaky aura. <laughs> um, this is uh, just a guy having uh, some thoughts. Birth, bed, bath, beer, bankruptcy, bunions, bifocals, balding, and beyond. Um, I, one of my favorite, I love lamps. I love to draw lamps. And 
this is almost my favorite kind of lamp, where they have like the table thing in the middle. I love like the multi-purpose lamp. I think that is a great thing. And one time I saw a lamp that had all of this and more. It had, it had what, <laughs> I thought it was a waste basket in the bottom. And, um, but then somebody said, that's not a waste basket, because then like every time they emptied the waste basket, they'd have to turn the, <laughs> the lamp upside down. So um, I think it was like a magazine stand or something, but it looked like a waste basket. But anyway, um, that's just my own personal <laughs> fun with furniture. I don't know. Um, this is a, in a just world. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, it says dunce, bitch. Uh, this is dousing for coffee. Um, uh, this is um, attack of the creeping doily. Just a uh, very. Uh, um, this is the little engine that coulda, woulda, shoulda, and he's just saying, "I knew I could, so why didn't I?" <laughs> And uh, uh, a, I love uh, gravestone cartoons. It's tuned in, turned on, dropped out, dropped in, worked out, saved up, dropped dead. <laughs> um, this is uh, how to drive your man crazy in bed. Um, do you love me as much as you did when you married me? What exactly is the flavor of Dr. Pepper? Whatever happened to Dwight Gooden? Did you ever have this ringing in your ear? Which is better, plasma or high def? How do you make a magnet? And it's just on and on and on. This is a, um, this is a, an obituary. Uh, comic. It's, uh, it's really, oh, okay, it's, uh, the guy is reading the obit page, and it's uh, two years younger than you, 12 years older than you, three years your junior, five years your senior, exactly your age, and then your age on the dot. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really weird how much, when I, when I read the obit, sometimes like I'll read somebody and uh, they'll be, like a year older than me, and how much better that makes me feel. <laughs> this, um, uh, this is narcissist cards. And uh, wow, your birthday is really close to mine. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Um, this is, I once had a sad thing happen to me too. <laughs> I, I can hardly speak about it without crying. And speaking of bone voyage, guess where I'm going? <laughs> France! <laughs> um, uh, this is the pharmacologist of Oz. So the scarecrow gets his Ritalin, the Tin Woodman gets L-Dopa, and the Cowardly Lion gets Xanax. <laughs> um, this is a... Uh, <sighs> uh, the end is near and you wish. Uh, this is uh, just some other stuff that I got into. I got really into making these Pisanki eggs, and I made a couple of hundred of them. I just was on this like rampage, um, and I learned how to do them. They're, they're, uh, you don't paint on them, you dye them, and you do this kind of wax resist sort of thing. So I, I, for a little while I had a series going where I liked, uh, I liked cans, and so this was Little Timmy Peas. Um, this was just some odd family here. Uh, they, they all had these giant ears. Uh, this was just a small amount of them. I got really totally nuts about them. Um, this, uh, the one in the front, there's the forbidden words of childhood, and you have somebody saying, shut up, uh, idiot, and, and stupid. These were like words what I was not allowed to say when I was a kid. Um, and recently I've been getting really, this was in the last issue uh, of the new, issue before the last one of the New Yorker with the, um, I did a spread called Cranksters uh, for the cartoon issue, and I got really into, they're like uh, block printing, but anyway, I wanted to show you. One, one thing that's great about the New Yorkers, they let me actually do a few other things besides cartoons, because I have a small attention span, so. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is a 
Last one, it's the vain but realistic queen. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who, if she lost 10 pounds and had her eyes and her neck done and had the right haircut, could in her age group be the fairest one of all? <laughs> That's it. So we're going to start moderating things now. I'm the moderator. Uh, they look calm and, and harmless, but they can be vicious. So I'm going to make sure they don't fight. I thought maybe the best way really to do this is because people have a lot of questions to ask rather than us talk to ourselves as we actually do a lot. <laughs> and I don't think it's necessary us to continue talking to ourselves. So why don't you talk to us? And I don't know, is there someone going to, you're going to we'll get talk questions about from people? And, and, and we will field the questions. Yes? Okay. Uh, when there have been serious political cartoons like the ones in Denmark, what had, had been your reaction to about the Muslims and some of those other cartoons that have caused problems? How do you feel about it and how do you address it? <laughs> well, I mean, in terms of the, uh, I mean, in terms of the New Yorker, the New Yorker's cartoons are, you know, I mean, are uh, not political, or to the extent I think they're political, people do cartoons, they sort of tri triangulate them through the prism of the personal. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas an editorial cartoon, it's an us and them. I'd say that uh, the, the, the distinguishing factor you see about these cartoons is they, you know, my, my thesis in general is basically humor, humor is, is, is ridicule. That's its primary function and, and, it, and, and it evolves. But, the, most of humor that you find in a society is, is the humor of self-satisfaction. In Roz's cartoon, Pat's, and you, saw, you find the humor of self-dissatisfaction, <laughs> of, of, of sort of seeing yourself through the prism. In terms of the Muslim cartoons, everybody was a coward on that. <laughs> no one, I'll tell you the funniest cartoon that we got that, that we didn't publish in the New Yorker for reasons that will be obvious to you. Uh, it's Muhammad in Heaven. This is a Sam Gross, the great Sam Gross, I might say, cartoon. And it's Muhammad in heaven, and the suicide bomber is all in little pieces. And Muhammad is saying to the suicide bomber, you'll get the virgins when, you, when we find your penis. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I mean I, you know, I, I mean, I think it was a culture class. The, the, the Danish cartoons were so incredibly mild by any of our standards. <laughs> but why don't other people, I mean, I guess it's a, what did we think of the whole... I flash back to the, uh, I think it was Kentucky Fried Movie or one of those uh, old movies where they had a bit about some guy who's a daredevil. And it was, it was some nerdy looking dude and he puts on the helmet and padded suit and you see him trucking out and he goes into a ghetto and he hollers the horrible racial epithet, and then runs like crazy. These cartoonists basically, you know, taunted some folks who they knew would be upset, and, and what do you know, they got upset. And so uh, it's, it's kind of like the guy in the Kentucky Fried Movie bit, or, or um, you know, if you go do something like that to provoke violence, don't be surprised when it happens. It's I couldn't disagree more. They did, absolutely, they did not do it to provoke violence. They did it because they were prohibited from drawing Muhammad. They did it to provoke. To provoke their whole, violence. Oh, their whole mission really, was to, to provoke. To provoke violence. You have, a guy, you have a guy drawing something and he's watching himself. That, that, that's absolutely not true. I think that, I think, I, you know, I mean, this is a real argument where someone's going to have to moderate between me and... Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to see if I can provoke ultimate, you. Ultimate fighting, <laughs> ultimate fighting cartoonists. Here's, this, here's my opinion. I think enormous more harm is done by respect than disrespect for everything. And that, and that, I mean, look what I Rod, Rod drew about, you know, you were making fun of the, you know, of the burkers. Their whole, you were making fun of the culture. I mean, mm -hmm. really, you should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I am. Do you have a vision? Right now, armies are massing to, go, to invade Ridgefield. You better get out, you know, all those Halloween ornaments that Franzen has to prevent yourself because they are coming for you. Yeah, so anyway, we can, we can agree to disagree, but you're wrong. <laughs> I will defer because he signs the paychecks. 
no. Despite his wrongness. And, and what, are you, what are you? What was your next question? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who are some of your favorite cartoonists? Not in the New Yorker. What? Not in the New Yorker. What did he say? Are there, there are cartoonists not in the New Yorker? <laughs> Could you apply the word favorite to them? Favorite cartoonist? Why don't you? Well, I mean, I guess I can go back to where the cartoonists I grew up with and the cartoonists I've come to appreciate. But many of them strip cartoonists from the 20s and well, the turn of the last century, on to people working today who really have a voice. And I think that's the main point: is somebody who's who's distinctive, whose, whose work you understand and at least you recognize as a, as a particular voice when you look at the drawing. You don't have to read anything else, but you know that's who it is. Uh, Walt Kelly, for example, and, uh, you know, well, Saul Steinberg, who of course, was a New Yorker cartoonist, but he was also much more um, widespread in his work, in the way it was disseminated. Um, George Harriman. Um, it turns, turns out Charles Adams learned how to draw by looking at George, copying George Harriman, Crazy Cat. Uh, Windsor McKay. The, the great, and Windsor McKay, and Old Colt, and uh, Dirk Boots. I mean, it can go on and on and on, I, for, for me at least. I admire many different people for very different reasons. Right. Do, um, do you like anybody? Oh, nah. <laughs> nah. Uh, I, I love Windsor McKay. I, I think he's amazing, and um, I, there's a lot of people working today. I like some of the, uh, um, like Daniel Klaus and uh, um, Peter Cooper, K-U-P-E-R. I like his stuff a lot. Um, oh, there's, uh, I love American Splendor, uh, Harvey Picard. Uh, I think that's just incredible. Um, I know. I love Crazy Cat also. That's a great strip. Um, same usual litany of folks. I mean, uh, the only two that you left out would be um, you know, Gary Larson and Bill Watterson. Of, mm. yeah. And I think they kind of were the last flaming heat in the newspaper comics, and um, everyone's just kind of holding on until uh, that whole industry dies. And of course, I'm a big fan of the Danish cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> By which he means the kind that come on a plate with... <laughs> I, I think the point to be made is that we all learn from, from those we see uh, and look at and study. And I think that's... We take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and incorporate yeah. it because that's how one learns I mean, a lot of what's being a cartoonist. Is that it's gone online or, or TV. Of course, The Simpsons is an amazing show. I mean, it's not a single yeah. cartoonist or something. But, 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 but there's a lot of interesting stuff. There's a lot of interesting stuff on the internet. It's hard for me to remember the names. There's a sometimes. huge amount of stuff. I mean, I, my daughter is, uh, she's 18, and there's a lot of like, future Bible heroes, I think there's one that's called. There's all kinds oh, yeah, of strips yeah. that people, the thing that's, that's sort of strange and a little frightening to me is like how people are going to make money doing this. Because I think the one thing about the internet is that uh, there's, there's so much entertainment that's for free that I wonder, I mean, like last night I was able to, I mean, I, you know, just watch a movie for free. And I think people are so used to getting their entertainment for free, like how mm. our future cartoonists. Well, gonna, I, I wonder, you know, one of the living. ways I see it developing is, and, and it's obviously bad if you want to make a living at it, but I think what's going to happen is that a lot of people are not, in fact, going to make a living at it, but they're going to yeah. do it right. anyway. And where they have other, 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 uh, 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 other jobs. And what they, what's interesting about it is, we all love The New Yorker. The New Yorker is a very restrictive environment, necessarily so, because it's supported by advertising, because it's, in effect, mixed company. It's, it's within the articles itself. You know, the rejection collection was published, and that was very, very successful. On the internet, you can find a niche. You can speak with your voice. Nobody can say, I mean, in, in, in The New Yorker cartoons, someone, somewhere, is always offended. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, if there's a cartoon, if, 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 if there's a cartoon in which uh, 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 there's a, it's a lab guy and he's looking at the, at the at the rodent, the rat, and the rat has, has hung himself, and he's saying uh, discouraging data on the antidepressant. 
You see, yeah. you get, I like animals. I don't like animals even to suffer in cartoons. You know, even, yeah. we, we, you, know, we, you know, we tell them we use anesthetic ink. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, it doesn't really hurt. But someone, but, but that's true. The New Yorker always, the New Yorker would never publish that Sam Gross cartoon, and really correctly so for the New Yorker, mm. but not correctly for that cartoon not to be published. So I think you're gonna, you see a lot of energy, a lot of interesting things on the internet, for, in terms of livelihood, it is, it is a difficult question, but there's a lot of funny stuff there. Other questions? Yes, could you, uh, the panel, compare and contrast the single panel cartoon with the, not the, the serial cartoonist, if you will, but the strip cartoons that are one-offs that, you know, just have a different one every week, although the same character. You mean they're still single panels? Uh, no, you know, they've had oh, three they have like four, three panels. Right. Is that a different craft? Are you ever tempted, or any of you single panel people ever tempted to get into that kind of thing? I or is that a just a strip. whole different business? I had, actually, right around the time that I was starting The New Yorker, I also had, I shortly thereafter got a comic strip. And it's very different. With The New Yorker stuff, um, my ideas come from, for, essentially from heckling, from something bouncing off and I hate, well, wait a minute, there's something in that and, or else the thing I want to say that I can't say. With the comic strip, uh, I, I'd sit down and write because it's character-based. And so it's, it's, a, it's a very different uh, form of storytelling, or it can be, uh, I would say should be, but um, this is still cartooning. It, uh, a gag cartoon, the beginning, middle, and end are all, you know, in, uh, contained in that, that one moment that you're capturing. Where on a strip you can kind of play along and it doesn't have to have quite the same punch. Well, Roz actually invented really her own form, which was a type of strip. I mean, many of Roz's cartoons were, in effect, three panels, not panels you know, connected so much right. in a way. But I, I think and Roz did it very, very successfully where, you, where you know, you know, she would invent to say, you know, the, uh, the three uh, the three certainties, you know, death, taxes, and then there's a clown, Bobo. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just, and, and, and one of the things Roz did is that I, I think she, she, she opened it up, she made it looser. The, the thing that I, I always find, I don't always find the strips deadly, I often do, because it seems like, in fact, they have a one-panel joke. Yeah. That they're yeah. trying to, to extend to, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, three panels. But I think, you know, if you've tried, every, everything is different. Uh, that, you, I mean, I think there's some transfer in these abilities. If you really had yeah. to do, you could, you could do it, but you're not quite, you, even if you're quite good at, at, at strip. W one of the things I find as a cartoon editor, sometimes you'll have someone who does strips who starts submitting single mm -hmm. panel, and you know, they're not quite there. That's not the thing they do. I, mean, I, like, the, I like that one thing about uh, working for The New Yorker is that if, if a joke is a single panel joke, and I can do it as a single panel joke, if it's a three panel joke, then I can do it as three. It, it really depends on the idea. And some ideas are, you know, a full page and they sort of need this little conversation to happen between the two people. That's, you know, it couldn't be in one panel. So I, I think the, the form has to sort of fit what the idea is. Um, but I think there's a way of actually developing oneself over the years that, that um, is almost, it comes so easily as to questions of, of what goes into a single panel cartoon. Namely, it's, it's, it's a bit like stage, uh, staging a situation. So you become a director, become a stage manager, become an interior designer. You do all of these things to compress in one instant uh, of recognition a lot of information. And somehow this is a skill that, and a mindset for me that just, uh, seems to be unshakable. So when I do try to do a series of drawings, um, I rather like the challenge and I like the literary kind of ch potential in it, but yet I always gravitate back to a kind of single compressive compression of, of what I'm trying to say. You, one of the things I think most people don't realize in terms of what the people do, what I guess I do also, is that it's actually a lot of work 
<laughs> it, 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 people say, oh, you must just walk around and get <laughs> ideas everywhere. For the most part, you don't. You actually sit down, you, and, 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 and uh, it's a little bit like Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, where you might find you, you, you lack, you know, his thing is 10,000 hours, putting in thousands of hours of doing something yeah. before you actually perfect the field. You find that, it, that, these, that you've done that, actually, mm -hmm. and that's why, really, you know, you can do it, so that when you're a David Mamet or, you know, <laughs> you're, you know, my cardiologist says, I have an idea for a cartoon, I say, oh, great, I have an idea for a bypass, but I, I, <laughs> <laughs> let, let's actually move on. Uh, it, 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 take, it takes a lot of work, and, and Roz and every one of them, if you look at the history of, of, of everybody's cartoons here, they, they, they got better, they worked, they, they understood the form. Well, we, we all submit, you know, it, I, I've had people say, oh, this must be so great, you turn in a cartoon every week and they buy it, and it's like, well, it's not exactly, you know, like that. I mean, we submit, you know, for me it's about seven, car six or seven cartoons every week. Um, when I was younger, it was a little higher, um, <laughs> but it's about six or seven cartoons a week, and sometimes they take one. Every blue moon, they might take two. Sometimes they don't take any. So, I mean, my stack of rejects at high, it's just, you know, they've filled two file cabinets, and there's piles on top of them. I mean, it's just enormous amounts of, There's you know, enormous, enormous honesty and integrity as a New Yorker that, that I'm, I'm not due to me, because I neither have honesty nor integrity, but... <laughs> but I inherited it. It's part of coming into this system and that every cartoon that gets bought gets, uh, gets looked at compared to all 74,000 cartoons that ran before. They get killed if they're too much alike. They get killed if there's too much alike from a cartoon from 2009 is too much alike from a cartoon from 1949, even though nobody is going to know. I mean, the, the, the system has integrity and also the thing, the, the, I mean, it's an exaggeration to say it, but to some extent it's true. What's most important about the New Yorker cartoons is that we reject all these people. That's right. Not yeah. that they, uh, not that everybody is accepted. That means nobody is, it, nobody gets a pass based completely on what they've done or celebrity. Yeah. And most of life, you know, isn't like that. So. But what, what, what we're all saying is that is to be a New Yorker cartoonist is a life of perpetual heartache. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but a good heartache. <laughs> Good-hearted, hardly. You have another question? Yeah. Uh, um, I was wondering, if you ever do run dry, are there any special things that you do to try to get the creative juices flowing? Oh, you don't run out of cartoons ideas, you run into them. <laughs> it, seriously, it's, do, you, do you run out of ideas for you know, waking up in the morning? It's, uh, it's, 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 cartooning, I, don't, I think I can probably speak for everyone here. It's not something we do, it's something we are. It's how we look at the world and you know, if the world disappears, you know, we'll you know, turn into our own heads to find cartoons. I think the best, best way of describing this is to read something that one of our earlier colleagues wrote as an introduction to a book of his, George Price. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, can remember his wonderful daffy marginal people, but he, he wrote this about he said, the grimmest part of this business is digging up ideas. Artists will go to almost any lengths to obtain sound ideas. I know of one who married a girl simply because she was a positive master of the dopey remark. <laughs> he piled up a tidy fortune, merely <laughs> illustrating dumb cracks culled from her everyday conversation. <laughs> Later, when she began to repeat herself, he divorced her. <laughs> but, but Ed, actually, this brings up a very interesting point. George Price did not get any of his ideas. Exactly so. You know, he, 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 and, and that's one of the differences between the way people work now mm -hmm. and the way they used to work. Peter Arnold did very few of his own ideas. He did, he did some, mm -hmm. but Jim Garrity, who was a, a, a comedy writer, and then, of course, the, the, the editor. So with William Shawn, uh, it, it shifted over to the idea, and I think it's an important idea also, and I think it's a difference between, between New Yorker humor and, if you will, high humor and low humor. And the, 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 the concepts of authenticity and creativity and originality are applied to cartoons. 
applied to cartoons. So Sean wanted the person who drew the cartoon also to think of the idea. And so we look at it in that way in The New Yorker. Is this a voice? Is it an authentic voice? Are the ideas actually original? Now, so in a way, The New Yorker humor is aspirational. I mean, uh, and most people don't have any aspirations for the sense of humor. They don't say, oh, I wish I had a better sense of humor. They say, no, my humor is fine. <laughs> I know what's funny. But one of the things I, that drew me to the New Yorker is they saying, oh, jokes can be made in an interesting way, a clever way, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what the New Yorker really is, is looking for, and it's looking for, for, for it in a single package. I think that's very unusual also where we are in society. You, look, Simpsons, many, many of these, Jon Stewart, these comedy shows, Colbert, but you know, there's a staff of writers. Mm -hmm. It's a collaborative effort to get this high, high, you know, sheen. L like in Roz's cartoons or anyone's cartoons, but I think especially in Roz's cartoons, you get people submitting cartoons like Roz, and some of them are actually pretty good cartoons. But Roz has done all the heavy lifting. She has said, you know, established the form. You might look at one of those panels and say, you know what, don't you think we could punch this up? And I think if you punched it up, it would be worse, because part of what you enjoy so much in someone like Roz is, oh, that's actually this person. You know, it's not a group of people.